Now, secondly, quickly, going on to this issue of moral decision-making, um, which Amy mentioned about, we're learning more and more about the neural circuitry that underpins and links to moral decision-making. So it's this issue of, yes, where in the brain is heaven and hell, the devil and the angel? What I want to get to before I show you some data is criminals know right from wrong. Stephen will talk, of course, that antisocial individuals do know right and wrong, and that underpins the law. But the question I have to try and go beyond that a little bit further, which is, I think, not really so much taken account in the law, is do these people, these psychopathic individuals, do they have the feeling for what's moral, like my son Philip, does he have the feeling for what's right? And we want to suggest that the, the emotional engine that drives moral decision making is broken in psychopathic individuals. So this is a dilemma that normal people like you would be faced. If we put you in a brain scanner, we would be scanning your brain, you'd be look, doing this moral dilemma that Amy mentioned. So this is the dilemma, you can read that. There's a runaway trolley that's heading to kill five railway workers. And standing next to you on the footbridge, you're, here's you, this is the runaway trolley, here's, here's the five railway workers. If you do nothing at all, the train will kill five people. But next to you is this large corpulent gentleman on the bridge. Now, if you push him off the bridge, he'll die, but you'll save five lives. The question in the moral dilemma is, what do you do in this situation? Now, if you do absolutely nothing at all, you are going to witness five deaths. Or can you push him off the bridge? Shouldn't you do that? You'll save five lives. Imagine yourself on that bridge. Imagine yourself, can you push him off the bridge? Can you push him off the bridge? You will save five. And you could say, look, he's overweight, he'll probably die early of heart disease anyway, let's have some meaning to his life, at least save five people, some good will come. And you can say, thou shalt not kill, and not do anything. But I think when you are going through that, you have an emotion and a feeling, an, emo an emotional dilemma in your head. You may know right from wrong, thou shalt not kill. But we suspect it's this emotion that drives moral behavior. If you don't have the emotion that drives moral behavior, you'll be immoral. In normal people, when they are conducting this type of dilemma, this region in the brain, the amygdala, is highly activated. It's very much linked to emotions, fear, anxiety. And this is overly simplistic. There's a wider brain circuitry underlying moral decision-making. But just to focus on this area, when we put psychopathic individuals into the same scanner, they have a significant reduction in the active activity in not just the amygdala, but other brain structures but that I won't, I won't bore you with, but which are part of the circuitry underlying moral decision making. The higher the psychopathy score, the lower the activation in the amygdala and this other neural circuit. So, you know, if the emotional fire that drives moral decision making is a bit burnt out in psychopaths, the question is, to what extent is it moral of us to punish these individuals, psychopathic though they may be, as harshly as we do under the current laws. And this is where we turn into this next issue of neuroethics and neurolegal neuro implications. And this is the bottom line here. If these individuals have neurobiological brain impairments, possibly early on in life, which they never asked for, then are they truly responsible for their actions. And Stephen is going to talk on about the legal meaning of responsibility. I won't discuss it in the legal context. I want to discuss it in a much broader, wider, uh, maybe humanistic context here. So let me give you a, a case study and maybe let me try and push the envelope a little bit here and put you in the courtroom and you're the jury. And what I want to try and describe, if I may, is the rape and murder of a beautiful young woman called Peyton Tuthill. She was a wonderful girl. You may have a daughter like her. Put yourself in that situation. Cheerleader, athlete. She mentored minority children and arranged the adoption of five of these minority children into homes. This is just a picture of her with three of the five. After finishing her college, she went to Denver and 
you know, as it turned out, she registered with a temporary employment agency and got an interview with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. She left her house at lunchtime. She was successful in her interview. She was coming back to the house, and there she met the defendant, Donta Page, who was burglarizing her home. Um, what we'll do at this point is segue from this to a, a four-minute documentary which gives the confession tape of Donta Page, the defendant, who raped and killed this young woman. We'll also hear from his mother. I want to present two sides of the story. I want to present the side for justice and retribution, which is the underpinnings of law and morality. And then after you hear the four-minute clip, I'll try and give another side, a brain imaging side, and if you like, a human side, to where that defendant came from. So if we could play the four minute tape, please. 99.5 The Hawk, Skywalker here on the Mile High Morning Show. Beautiful day in Denver. And the Denver forecast is calling for a high at about 50 degrees. We're at 35 right now. Right now though, let's check on the traffic and see how it's looking. In late 1998, 21 year old Dante Page was sent to live in a rehabilitation center in Denver. A few months later, after a confrontation with the staff, he spent the night on the streets. The next day, he saw a woman leaving her house. So I went to the back door, couldn't get in, so I went to the basement door. Got in through that way. I went through the house, looking for stuff I could probably sell to get money. It was the home of 24-year-old Peyton Tuthill. Peyton was so full of life, so high-spirited, loved by everyone. When she walked into a room, she lit it up. She had a special magic about her. That day, Peyton had been to a job interview. She'd returned home to change. I was in the back by the back door when I heard the front door. At that time, she encountered the murderer, and there was quite a physical battle that ensued after that with her trying to protect herself and to get away. I chased her. He tried to grab her. She fought. She fought, fought very hard. She was trying to get up the stairs. She ran upstairs from her. But he grabbed her. He would not let her make it that far. But then he tied her with electrical cord, and he left her, and he left the house, and she was okay. But then he changed his mind, and he opened and re-entered the house. She struggled further and begged him and cried and begged for her life and begged for him not to kill her. But he didn't stop. He slit her throat to stop her screams. And then I learned how he cut her hair and her wrist to keep her from fighting. He proceeded to stab her many, many times. I don't know all the details of her death, but those were the events leading up to her death. Dante Page was arrested, he confessed, and he's now awaiting trial.